After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. <laughs> come on in and come see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. You guys can have a seat. I love that last part. Afraid, yet filled with joy, they ran to tell his disciples. The church has not stopped fearfully and joyfully running to tell people about Jesus since that first Sunday. So here we are continuing that tradition of proclamation that began in 32 or 33 AD, celebrating something that God did that was impossible, raising Jesus from the dead and making that impossible thing, restoration, possible for us. Now, I know some people came to church on Easter and you're, and, and you're not super spiritual. I, I get that. Maybe you came here because we're having some free cookies and orange juice after church. That's fine. Maybe you're here because you, your wife made you come. That, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Just kidding. But fellas, I understand how that goes. Maybe you're here because your parents made you come or your grandma made you come. That's why I came to church when I was young, because my grandma made me go to church. And maybe you're going to be looking at the time to kind of figure out how much longer you got. I only preach for two hours. Don't worry. I'll be done relatively shortly before dinner. Just kidding. Again, I understand that. I understand paying attention to the time and, and, and coming on Easter just because you feel like you got to. So I feel like a tremendous amount of pressure to make sure you leave, leave here feeling like you've learned something. Okay, like So I want to talk about something really serious and critical about Easter. Peeps. <laughs> now, last week, amen? Last week, I talked about peeps during my sermon, and I said they were nasty. I got some hate mail, some text messages from what I thought were good Christian people, <laughs> people that I loved, people that I loved. I even got this passive-aggressive stuffed peep here, keychain, from a good friend of mine, from a good friend of mine. Now, I think it's important that we settle this matter once and for all about the peeps, but I'm going to need your help. This is that one thing you've got to come away from, this message, knowing for sure that you know something about. So we're going to decide whether or not we like, we like peeps, okay? Now, I know there's a couple people, like this one guy over here who likes peeps. So when I give him the opportunity, he's going to cheer. But for the rest of you, maybe you don't. So what I'm going to say is, do you like peeps? And you're going to say, yeah. And I say, do you not like peeps? You're going to say, yeah. Okay. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this thing, okay? We're going to try to figure this out. So if you like peeps, I want to, you to give us a round of applause. <laughs> if you can't stand peeps, let me hear you. <laughs> All right. All right, so what you're going to do is if you get peeps in your Easter basket, give them to the people and put your hand up if you like peeps. Okay, give them to those people. Give them to those people. Now you can leave here understanding at least one thing about Easter, right? Now back to Jesus. Why are we celebrating Easter? Like, honestly, why are we celebrating Easter? Easter. And this is a question for all you folks who are here because your wife made you come, or your grandma made you come, or your mom made you come. But it's also a question for the people who have been coming to church for their entire lives. It's a question that we should all seek the answer to. Not every Easter, but every single day, and review it. Because as I said last week, if Easter is true, and we believe that it's true, 
It has consequences and ramifications and meaning and impact for every part of your lives and every fabric of your being. If Easter is true, if it's true that God came to earth to draw us back to him, if it's true that he died on a cross for our imperfections, if it's true that he came back to dead so that we could be alive and made alive and given new life, well, that demands some sort of response from us. And the, way we res- res- and the way we respond to that determines all sorts of things about how we live now and how our future looks and how we behave and our relationships and all that kind of stuff. But let's be honest, a lot of us don't really care about that spiritual stuff. I'm going to be honest because that's how I was for a long time. And even some days when I wake up. So there's this unspoken agreement here when you come to church on Easter that I'm the preacher and I'm going to talk about cute religious stuff and you may or may not listen depending on whether or not you think I'm interesting or not. And, and, and I get that again because that's the same attitude when I have when I go visit a church. Like you just, you know, you want to kind of hear what the pastor has to say and maybe you like it, maybe you won't. But the reality is here, right now, we are all living right here in Painesville, Ohio in 2018. So whenever we talk about this spiritual stuff, it really, it, it has to have value for today. It has to mean something for today. It has to mean something for right now. I mean, heaven is fine and dandy, but we ain't there yet, right? Like we ain't there. I mean, it could happen. Like I could fall off the stage into this hole right here and something can happen, but that's just not going to happen yet because I'm going to stay back here. Who knows what can happen, but right here and right now, we're not in heaven just yet. And heaven ain't going to pay the bills or help the kids with their homework. And heaven ain't going to do the laundry or feed the baby. So if I were here because my mom and dad asked me to go or because my my husband made me come or if, if I was here and I've been going to church for 20 years and haven't missed a Sunday, the question I'd want to know is how does this day, Easter Sunday, impact me today And every day, how is Easter Sunday relevant for the here and now in Painesville or Perry or Madison or Mentor or wherever you live? Now, I get all the heaven stuff, but what does that have to do with my life right now? Why do we celebrate Easter and what the the heck does it have to do with how we live our lives? I did a lot of thinking about that last week because I knew I'd have this opportunity to communicate about Easter. So I was thinking and I was praying and I'm asking God, God, what do you want me to communicate about Easter? What is the one thing that can make Easter relevant? What is the one thing that, that you want me to communicate into the hearts of people about Easter and the importance of Easter? And the spot that I landed on, the truth that came to my heart, is this idea that the reason we celebrate Easter, the reason it's relevant for us right now, is because the resurrection provides us with a permanent joy and the promise of hope. The resurrection provides us with permanent joy and the promise of hope. And that may not sound super practical to you, but I think it boils down to this. It boils down to this truth. It doesn't matter what your life situation is, and I'm talking to you if you're a single mom. I'm talking if you, to you if you're an addict or a former addict. I'm talking to you if you have three kids and you got a two-car garage and you live in the suburbs. I'm talking to you if you've been living on the streets. All of us, and I mean all of us, want to have that sensation of joy and happiness, and you want that to last, right? Of course. And you want to have hope. When things are at their worst. And I don't care if you're from Ashtabila or Nepal or Bangladesh or Painesville or Perry or Thompson. Every human being who has ever lived has this desire. The sensation of joy and happiness. And the desire to want that to last. Maintaining hope when, even when things are at their worst. And I can prove this to you. How many people here like to eat food? Put your hand up. You and the baby can put their hand up. Everybody likes to eat food. And everyone's got something that's your favorite. I like tacos. I'm not going to lie. I've eaten too many of them. I'm paying the price for that. Look, H&M doesn't sell double X large, all right? <laughs> so we get, we, we're working on a little problem here, all right? My, my buddy said to me the other day, he says, either them skinny pants got to go or that belly's got to go, but you can't keep both. 
Thanks a lot, tacos. Now, if you're eating some tacos and you, or you're eating whatever it is that you like and you're looking forward to it, you're preparing it, you're putting it in the oven or the skillet and you're smelling the smells and you're, and, and, and you're enjoying it and then you eat it and you start to like the food that you're eating, the endorphins start to kick in, you're really enjoying it, and then maybe you eat a little too much, right? Who's with me? Come on, don't be shy. Amen? Yeah, that's right, I know. I know who I'm with. You eat a little too much, and you start to get a little sick. And you see, you wanted that fulfillment, and you had it for a minute, but it didn't last. We've all been in this spot. How many people have been to a salon or a barber? You been to a salon? All the ladies been to the salon? A couple of you gentlemen been to the barber? You got your hair did? You got lined up? You know what I'm talking about. And you snap some photos. You put on Instagram. You put on Snapchat. You went to the mall. You made sure that all your friends saw you that day because you wanted them to be like, oh, look at you. You know what I'm talking about. But as great as you felt, you had to make another appointment for a few weeks later because that hair is going to grow back for some of you. <laughs> that hair is going to grow back or it's going to look all messed up again. The color's going to fade. So you had to make that second appointment. Praise the Lord for your barber. They might be here today. Praise the Lord for your salon person. Come on now. Don't be shy. They might be here today. That's right. So you had that sense of satisfaction for a minute. You felt good for a minute, but you knew it wasn't going to last. We've all had that sense of joy, that sense of satisfaction, that sense of happiness, that feeling of fulfillment. And sometimes this feeling can last for a few moments, and sometimes it can last for a few days, but it's always temporary, and we know it's going to go away, because we know something else is going to come up and snatch that joy away, right? You get a new job, well, guess what? You're, you get a flat tire on the way to, to your new job. You get a raise, your car breaks down. You start working out, you break your leg, right? This is how life goes. This is how it happens. We know something's going to come and snatch that joy away. We know we're going to come back down to earth. The best example I can think of this, that roller coaster that we go through in our lives happened to me back in the summer of 2016. And I, and I know you're going to know what I'm talking about because you guys went through this with me, okay? May 27th, I see some people nodding their heads. May 27th. 2016, a lot of us were excited because our basketball team, the Cleveland Cavaliers, were going to the NBA Finals, and it was going to be it was two years in a row. In 2015, we came close. We put up a good fight, but they came back because we were injured. Kevin Love was out. Kyrie was out. Man, good old Matthew Delvadova, I'm not sure how to say his name right, but he was playing hard, man. He had to get some IVs, got to go to the hospital, and we just couldn't hang on. But 2016, we were ready, right? We were ready to go. That team had, had the Golden State Warriors had won more games than anybody else ever, but we were feeling good. This was our time because everyone was back. Now, I don't know about you, but I get pretty anxious when it comes to sports. I can't always, like, like high-pressure moments. I can't always watch the game. So I do this thing where I, I kind of be watching from the other room. Or I'll just like do the refresh on my phone or kind of turn the radio on a little bit. And that's what game one was like for me. I couldn't watch the game because I was so nervous. And it's a good thing that I didn't because we got blown out 89 to 104. Who remembers? It was terrible. So you know I did the same thing the second game. I couldn't watch it. I had to do the radio thing, the refresh thing. They're like watching out of the corner of the room. Like closing the door, open the door, right? Did that. Lost again. Blown out. 77 to 110. And at this point... We are all angry and disappointed because people are making fun of us. People make fun of us in Northeast Ohio. I have no idea why, because we're the best. Weather's great. Economy's fantastic. Nothing ever bad ever happens here. That's a lie. People make fun of us. People were making fun of us. We were angry. We were in a bad mood. But you know what? We're used to this. We can do this, right? We're used to this. And maybe you got a little bit of hope. Maybe game three's coming. Maybe we come back. And we did. We came back home, and we, we, we won. We, we won big, and we did great. And so that emotional roller coaster is back up here, right? You remember? We're back up here. We've been, we were down for a few games. 
but, but we're doing good. We're ready for game four. Now, while this is going on, we're a couple months away from starting Altar Church. It's, it's, it's the summer of 2016. We were going to launch in September. And so I went to New York City to go pick up Brian. We love Brian. Give it up for Brian Santos. Give it up Brian. So I went to New York City to go pick up Brian, and I watched game four from a hotel room in New Jersey. Jared Bush was there. Remember that, Jared? You remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jared was there. All right, Jared's, in, Jared's the, the guy in the back who does some stuff. So we love Jared. Give it up for Jared now. Give it up for Jared. So <laughs> we watched this game four from a hotel room in New Jersey, and it was close for a while, but it didn't end well. Didn't end well. The next day, we went to pick up Brian, and his dad said to me, his dad, his dad's cool. He's a cool guy. He says, Aaron, the Cavs are going to win the next three games. I said, man, you don't know what you're talking about. You're not from here. <laughs> you don't know how we do this in Cleveland, man. We, we, you don't know how we do this. You, you, you're, not, you're, you're not hip to what we do. We lose, man. But he assured me, we're going to win. That You're going to win the next three games, Aaron. Well, we won a game. And then we won another game. And then we go into game seven. Do you remember that feeling? We're, down, we're tied up. 3-3 three, three, going back to Golden State. Do you remember how you felt? Encouraged? Excited? We had this momentum, and we all had this sense that we could do something. Do you remember what you were doing that night? Do you remember where you're at? Anybody remember where you're at? Right? Of course you remember where you're at. I was in my basement with my family. And there was 15 people in my house, and there was cars lined up and down the street. Like, even in my neighborhood, there was this festive atmosphere. People knew something exciting was happening. Do you remember that shot? Kyrie hit that shot? And Kevin Love played some, some, some awesome D on, on Steph Curry? And do you remember what LeBron said? He held that trophy, and he said, Cleveland, this is for you. Remember that? People were going crazy at my house, jumping up and down. People were crying. My dog started freaking out, and he started biting my leg. <laughs> like, I, like, I got a video of this. I'm going to share it after church. But I'm like, we won, we won, we won. You know, I have that voice, and I get excited. We won. And my, I'm like, my dog is biting me. And we got that Facebook video. I'm going I'm to share it after church. And we went outside, and people are freaking out, laughing and crying. People wandering the streets. There's cars going up and down the street, honking horns. This true story. My daughter took a mattress out of the house, and me and my brother-in-law tried to light on fire in the driveway. My wife told us we weren't allowed. Lame. I know. I know. And then, of course, you saw the streets of Cleveland, and people having a great time, and people were ecstatic, and they were hugging one another. And for once, people couldn't laugh at us, right? We came back in record-breaking fashion to beat those punks. We did that, right? And then there's that scene coming off the plane. LeBron had that ultimate warrior shirt on. J.R. Smith apparently never wears a shirt. And then you had that parade. I was there. I fist bumped Kyrie. No, I wasn't, but there was like two million people there, so everyone can say that you were there, right? No one can say you weren't. So I was there. Now, if you remember that, you probably remember one of the top five moments in your life. I'll be honest. That was for me. That was for me. Because we finally did it. It felt good. We were something. The underdog. We were the underdog. And we finally did something no one expected us to do, and it felt so good. But the problem is, we knew it wasn't going to last. All that hugging and handshaking was going to go away. I remember thinking, I'm looking at people hugging, I'm like, Y'all are crazy. You're going to be behind him on the freeway. He's going to be driving in the slow lane, and he's going to be going too slow for you, and you're going to flick him off in like three days. And now you're hugging your, your best friends forever, right? So we knew that was going to wear off. The party had to stop. We all had to go back to work, and we knew that team would change. And we probably will never feel that same way again. So as much as we love sports and as much as we love all those really cool elements that sports bring, like cheering and community and fun and family and food, the th those things that provide that level of happiness, like those really great moments of happiness, they don't last. And the hope that we place in them is misplaced hope, and we know that. So what Easter provides us is that feeling that same feeling we got in June of 2016, that elation, that sense of community, 
that feeling that we were all in this together, that triumphant feeling of overcoming. But we get that, and we get to keep that. It's not just something that other people are doing for us and we observe. It's something that's done for us that we get to participate in. Something that was done for us that impacts us, that directs our future, that impacts how we feel and how we think and how we treat people. What made June 2016 so wonderful was temporary joy, temporary joy, and a completion of hope. We felt great, and we got what we wanted, but it wasn't going to last, and we knew that. And what Easter gives us is permanent joy and a promise of hope, a joy that's locked inside of us, and I hope it endures through every trial. Maybe you're here because your parents made you come, or your husband made you come, or your wife made you come. Maybe you've been coming to church for 30 years, no matter where you're at, however you came here this morning, you can have access to a permanent joy and the promise of hope. A permanent joy and the promise of hope for four reasons. The first is the resurrection of Jesus teaches us that no one, and I'm talking not a single person, is too far from God. When men were pounding nails into the hands and feet of Jesus, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus was offering forgiveness to the men who were executing him. And then he forgave all the friends that abandoned him. Jesus had some great buddies on Thursday. What were they at on Friday? I didn't. Only one, only one hung around. And so if he can offer forgiveness to those people, what does that say about me? Now, I, I haven't placed nails in the hands of Jesus, but maybe you're thinking, I have been a terrible mother. I have been incredibly dishonest. I have met, made relationship choices that have left people terribly hurt. I've stolen from my friends. I've been locked up and strung out. So what will Jesus say about me? Father, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. Father, forgive her. She doesn't know. Second, the resurrection of Jesus teaches us that God can restore even the most broken parts of our lives. And in and, and that word brokenness, we all have a different standard for what that means. A lot of us can feel that in different ways. Some people walk in the doors of a church and you've been abused, but just no one knows about it. You know about it, but no one else knows about it. You felt abandoned, you've been unloved, or you feel like you're not worthy of love, or maybe that God can't love you or wouldn't want to love you. Or maybe you walk into church and, and, and knowing with a weight on your shoulder, the burden on your shoulder, that someone has hurt you in a big way. Maybe you've lost someone that you love. Or you've lost a job and you're the one that has to figure out how to support your family. That could be you. There's 250 stories in this room. That could be you. Maybe your story is worse. Maybe your story is so bad that I couldn't repeat it or you wouldn't want to hear it spoken. Maybe your story is so bad nobody else knows about it. Just you and God. Let me speak this into your life, and I want you to hear me. God took the broken body of Jesus and brought it back to life. So he has compassion for your brokenness and the power to bring healing and restoration into your life. And because he has conquered death, you have the power to walk out of darkness and into victory. 
and healing and restoration. You don't have to stay where you're at. You don't have to feel bogged down and beat down. Your story hasn't been completed. Because in the name of Jesus and by the power of the resurrection of Jesus, what is broken has been restored and that means you. There's more. Number three. The resurrection teaches us that God has established a family on earth with a common purpose. The church. And I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about this building or that building or the church up the road. I'm talking about a community. The community of church is the hope of the world. We are a community that together believes that we are compelled to behave in an upside down, countercultural sort of way where we serve the poor, we love the sick, we welcome the outcast, we clothe the naked, we visit the imprisoned, we forgive the guilty, we elevate the meek, we honor the humble. And we do this together as a community because we believe it changes other communities. Because once people see it, they are captivated by it. So the family of believers, that's us, that's the church, is always moving forward together with a singular mission to change the world through love and peace and a commitment to one another. I think this speaks to the heart of people who don't have family. A lot of people here, your family situation isn't good. You haven't talked to your family. There's been tremendous hurt in your family. There's been abandonment. There's been hurt feelings. People have treated you poorly. Because of the resurrection, because of our common state of forgiveness and healing, we share compassion and concern for one another, one another regardless of where we grew up. We have a mutual love for one another that goes beyond race, Beyond gender, beyond nationality, there is no illegal immigrant or foreigner in the family of God because we are all citizens together, unified. Number four, in the resurrection of Jesus, we learn that love is an action. See, the way we're trained to think about love is that love is a, it's a feeling, I love the things that are going to make me feel great. I love people that are going to make me feel great. If you upset me or I grow tired of you, I'll just stop loving you, right? That's, that's kind of how we do things. That's how human beings do things. The resurrection says that love isn't a feeling. Love is a verb. Love is an action. Love is an activity. Love is compelling enough to make God come down from his throne to lay dead on a cross. Love is powerful enough to walk into abandonment and rejection, sorrow and tears, poverty and pain. Love dies for its enemies. Listen, love dies for its enemies and forgives again and again, and again, and again. And, and through all of that teaches us some really hard stuff. And it shows us the ropes until you screw up again. And then it forgives you again, and again, and again, and again. And I could say this 70 times seven, but I think you get the point. Forgiveness 490 times is just the start. Love, this activity that is inspired by the resurrection, points to Jesus and it says, do you see that? Loving sinners and eating with strangers and, and giving to beggars. Yeah, you go do that too. Do it too. And while that seems impossible, it's not. Because the one that is risen, the one that forgives, 
the one that fixes broken things, the one that creates families, the one that personifies and defines love, now dwells inside of me. So I have a permanent joy in the promise of hope. A permanent joy and the promise of hope. That feeling I want of satisfaction and fulfillment, it doesn't leave me anymore. It doesn't go away. The hope I want when life seems impossible is rooted and established. So because the resurrection teaches us forgiveness, do you know what I am? Forgiven. Because it fixes broken things, I know that I am restored. Because it creates families, I know I am included. Because it is the greatest symbol of love, I know that I am loved. Forgiveness. Restored. Included. And loved. Forgiven. Restored included and loved maybe you're here because mom and dad made you come maybe you're here because your husband made you come maybe you're here because you had to check it off a list you didn't expect to have any sort of encounter with God but I want to speak those words again into your life and I want you to hear them Forgiven, restored, included, and loved. Maybe you've been going to church for 30 years, 35 years, haven't missed a Sunday. And maybe you have to hear those words again. Forgiven, restored, included, and loved. As you sit here today on Easter Sunday, maybe you didn't plan on showing up today. Maybe you just found your way here. Do you need forgiveness? Are you holding on to something right here and you feel like God can't forgive you or he doesn't want to forgive you? You don't even know how to go about taking the first step. You just know you feel guilty. You feel condemned. You feel the pressure and the weight and the burden. Maybe you feel like you need restored. You've been feeling broken down. You've been feeling battered and beat down. You've been feeling hurt and you need God to breathe some kind of life back into you again. Maybe you need included. You've never had family or you've been turned away. I can imagine how that would feel to reach out to family and have them tell you no to have family turn you away, but maybe you know. Maybe in the middle of all that rejection, you need God to open up his arms to you. Maybe today, you need love. Like real, willful, powerful love that will go to battle for you. Do you want the love of God to wash over you and bring you peace? Do you want his presence and power in your life more than ever before? If that's you, don't miss the moment. Don't miss the moment. There's a story in the book of Luke, and, and Jesus, he's risen from the dead, and he's making appearances to people, and these guys are walking down the street. They're, they're going on this walk, and, and, and they're disciples. They knew Jesus. They hung out with Jesus for a long time. And they're having this conversation, and, and Jesus comes up and walks beside them. And they go on talking, and, and they're talking to Jesus. They just don't know who Jesus is. They don't recognize him because they're too wrapped up in their own story. What I wonder is how long Jesus has been walking alongside of you. How long has he been walking next to you? And you just didn't realize it was him because you're wrapped up in your own story. 
the risen king walking step by step next to you and you don't even realize it. Forgiven, restored, included, and loved. Don't be so wrapped up in your own story that you don't embrace all he's offering. Let's make today the moment. Let's make today the moment that you embrace the one walking beside of you. And as the music plays, and I want to I wanna dim the lights a little bit. Right now on this Easter, Easter Sunday, I just want you to close your eyes. And as you sit in this chair in this, this place that's different, I want, to, I want you to reflect on God, the God who's been walking alongside of you, the Jesus who's been calling you, calling your name, and as you sit there, as you sit there needing forgiveness, restoration, you need family, you need love, take this moment. It's just you and God. Just you and God. If you need a fresh sense of forgiveness in your life, if you want God's grace and mercy to fall on you today like never before, just put your hand in the air. Just you and God. No one's looking at you, just you and God. Keep your hand up. If today as you sit here, you feel like you need restoration because you, bro you came into church and you felt broken, you felt like this was your last hope, you felt like there was no other way, but God, I'll give this a chance, God. I'll give it a try, God. If you need God's grace and mercy and restoration to fall on you today like never before, just put your hand in the air. If you've come here because you had no one else, because you felt lonely, because you felt there was no one there for you, because you didn't have family, and you want to feel that inclusiveness of the church, the inclusiveness of the gospel. You want people to take you as you are. People who will walk with life through life with you. People who will counsel and care for you and lift you up. If you want to feel included, put your hand in the air. If you came here today and you felt like you weren't worthy of love, that you couldn't be loved, that your story was too rough for God, that your past was too broken for God, if you came here not knowing that Jesus went to the cross for you, he walked that path, and if you were the only one, he'd still walk the path. If you want that grace to fall fresh on you today, If you want that love and mercy to fall fresh on you today, and this should be every hand in the church, put your hand in the air. It's just you and God. Today you are making a declaration of your dependence on him. On Easter Sunday, you're saying, Jesus, you've rose from the dead. You have risen, and I am yours. I need you, Jesus. Stand up, church. Let's worship together. Jesus, this is your day. Jesus, this is your moment. Jesus, I am yours. Jesus, I will serve you today and every day. This moment and every moment because you are risen.